Okay, here we go. Whoops. <laughs> My microphone. The fabulous new Westport Library and the Quick Center for the Arts proudly presents Oh Brother, Not Another Podcast, now on iTunes, with me, Migs Burroughs. And I'm Trace Burroughs. Uh, today, we're very excited to have um, a legendary record promotion man on our show, Richard Tatoyan. He was the national promotion director for A&M Records and worked as a promotion guy for many other companies. He's worked with The Who, Peter Frampton, Leslie West, Jack Bruce, Mountain, Foreigner, and many others. How you doing there, Richie? I'm doing great. It's good to hear you, too, and it's good to be on your podcast. So um, tell us, let's get right into it. Um, I know that in one of the stories um, is about how A&M Records sent you, was it to Montreal, to meet George Harrison. Tell us all about that. Okay. Uh, when when uh, George signed a deal with A&M Records for his label, Dark Horse, we were going to be the distributor. And I got a call from my boss, Harold Childs, in L.A., because I was, the, I was the only national promotion man out of the New York office. So he called me and said, Herb and Jerry wants you to represent the promotion department and fly to Toronto and meet with George Harrison and greet him for a and Records to let him know we're very happy and thrilled for this uh, signing. I said, okay. So I got on a plane. I flew to the uh, hotel, uh, checked in, uh, went to my room, started putting my, taking out everything out of my suitcase and putting it uh, in the drawers, and all of a sudden there's a knock on the door, and in walked in Pat Luce, who used to date Bill Graham. She was one of Bill Graham's assistants, and a very pushy, pushy woman. And she was always yelling at people and this and that, so she came in, she goes, what are you doing here? I said, what do you mean, what am I doing here? I was asked to come here to greet George, on behalf of A&M's promotion staff. She said, well, I just have to tell you that his manager, Dennis, has said that George is not talking to anyone except Herb Alpert and Jerry Moss. I said, oh, okay. So as I was pack unpacking, I started packing. I started taking my sweater and shirts and whatever, whatever out of uh, the dresser drawers and putting it back in my suitcase. She said, now what are you doing? I said, well, I'm packing to go home. And when I go back to New, to New York, and they asked me how the show was, I, I'm going to tell them, well, I really don't, uh, I don't know because Pat Luce told me I couldn't meet George. She went, you fucking asshole, and walked out of the room. So I'm sitting there going, now what do I do? What's happening? Pretty soon she comes back into the room and she says, okay, follow me. So she walks down the hallway, she opens this door, and there's this very large conference room. Uh, and there's no one in it, except there's a big, big poster of Sergeant Pepper's uh, album cover, giant poster. And I'm, and then she leaves. I'm standing there all by myself. Out of the other side of the room, this gigantic room, the door opens and in walks George Harrison. I almost fainted. Because I mean, no one had ever, we had never met him and since he was a Beatle. So he walks over and he says, he puts his hand up and he says, hello, I'm George. I said, hello, George. I'm Rich Katoya. And he said, so, how do you like Toronto? <laughs> I said, well, I don't know. I just got here. Oh, you don't live here? I said, no, no, no. George, I'm your national promotion man for a &M Records. I'm here to greet you on behalf of Jerry Moss and Herb Alpert and, and the L.A. staff to, to welcome you to, Northern, to, this, to your first concert here. He said, oh, Richie's, Richie's a, a, a national man. And he threw his arms around me. 
one arm. <laughs> so he carries me over, not carries me, he leads me <laughs> over to the, uh, <laughs> the poster, and he starts telling me how every one of the people on the Sgt. Pepper poster met something to the Beatles. And he's pointing, did you see this one here? He did this and he did that. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, in my head, it's just buzzing. It's going, like this. And he says, and this one, and he, and this one was the guru. And I'm thinking, I wish I had a tape recorder because I'm not going to remember a damn thing this guy's telling me. So when that was all over with, he said, so, am I going to see you at the show tonight? I said, absolutely. He said, fabulous. So he left. I went back to my room, and I thought, okay, I've got to call up Tosca, who was a publicist in, in Toronto, and I met her when we were on the Festival Express train, which is another story that had the Grateful Dead and Janis Joplin. And Malcolm. I saw that movie. That was a great movie. Yeah, I'm in that movie. I'm oh, in the yeah. very beginning of the movie, if you see <laughs> It's crazy because I took a friend of mine to see it in the theater and he said, do you think you're in the movie? I said, I don't think so because uh, Brett Prager and Gary Kerfers would not sign the release. They were anti-movie mm. at the time. So I said, I don't think, I'm, but when the movie opens up, there's a picture of me standing next to Jerry Garcia. And I yelled in the theater, there I am! <laughs> Everybody turned around and went, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> I brought the, the, I still had the booklet for the show. Talks about Janice being a great up and coming artist and blah, blah, blah. So, okay, where were we now? I got, I got off track. You were uh, talking about the Sergeant Pepper, a mural on the wall, and George was pointing out all the different people. Oh, right, right. And he said, uh, so will I see you tonight? And I said, yes, I'll, I'm going to. Then I called Tosca, and I hadn't talked to her since the, the Festival Express train. I said, Tosca, I'm taking you to see George, the George Harrison tour tonight with the Indians. She cracked up laughing, and she, Robbie Shankar, and the Shankarettes, I used to call. And uh, she said, oh, my God, I was wondering, how am I going to get a ticket to that? And I said, well, you're going with me. So anyway, we get in the car, we go to the Maple Leaf Gardens, we get out of the car, we have VIP parking backstage, and uh, the, the fellow back there, he says, there's the stage door, open that door, and you'll be in the arena, at the back end of the arena. So I op they, we open the door, and I'm standing there, and I, I see George leaning up against the very back of the railing uh, while Ravi Shankar and his group are performing. And Tosca says, Rich, he's waving at you. Waves back at him. I said, how do you know he's waving at me? She said, well, the only, your hair, your wild hair is the silhouette. He's waving at you. There's nobody else in our doorway. Wave back. So I wave back. He comes running down the back stairs of the stage, runs over and hugs me. Hello, Rich. I said, hello, George. I hugged him. I said, this is my friend Tosca. He said, hello, Tosca. And he hugged her. He said, we'll see you after the show. And he jumps back up on stage. And so we, we go in. We watch the show. And after, there's an intermission. And, we're, you know, it's, it's really fun to be that close to everything and, and seeing all the excitement or whatever. Now, after the, the intermission, I saw a lot of my Canadian counterparts that worked for A&M. Uh, I knew a lot of them because we used to spend a lot of time back and forth in Canada. And they'd come to the U.S. for meetings and things like that. So I'm hearing them all going, A, A, A. And I said, what the hell are you guys all a and about? They said, well, this is here. It's really. And all of a sudden, I see Bob Dylan, and he's walking. Uh, he's walking down, and no one's talking to him. And he's Love to hear about Dylan. Yeah, go ahead. I can't. Think, I can't think of his name right now, but I'll, it'll come to me. One of the guys in the band. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Famous, famous drummer. See, I'm... Levon. Levon Helm? No. Uh, no, no, no. no not Keltner. From, not from... No. Uh, well, it's all right. Yeah, we'd like... We're dying to hear about Dylan. Oh, I know who it was. It was Jim Keltner. <laughs> so both he and Jim Keltner have on these little granny sunglasses, little skirt. They look very ominous. So they're walking down the together, and no one's talking to them. And I thought to myself, you know, Jesus, I, I'm friends with Rick Danko, the bass player in Dylan's band, because I used to I, I stay up at Leslie's house in Woodstock, and Rick Danko always comes and hangs out with me, and we drive around in his Porsche and uh, smoke a joint. And when, he's, when we're finished, he puts the roach in the ashtray. And I said to him, what the, what the hell kind of a rock star are you where you're saving the roaches? <laughs> and then he said, a great wife, he says, well, Rich, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> So did, did so, you, I heard, there's a note that you smoked with Dylan, so I'm just curious, did he, did he ever write any lyrics with you or in front of you? No. no. Okay. So anyway, I took my card, my a &M card, and I wrote on the back, Dear Rick and Elizabeth, I lost your phone number. I was going to call you when you guys were in L.A., and I was in L.A., but I, I lost all your phone numbers or your stats or whatever I said. Please get in touch with me. And so when Dylan was walking by, I, I said, Bob, and all of a sudden he stopped. He walked over to me. Now the flashbulb started. Everybody's taking pictures of this screwball me talking to Bob Dylan. And he took his granny glasses and he leaned over and he said, yeah. And I didn't even speak that. You know what I mean, but Bob, but then I know Rick and Elizabeth, and I lost my phone book. Blah, 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 blah. So he takes the card, he <laughs> looks at the front where it says Rich Story Damn Records. He turns the back and he sees what I wrote, and he says, You want me to take this card and give it to Rick Danko so, they can, so you can talk to them, so you call them? I said, yeah. He said, okay. And he put it in his shirt. Uh, whew, I was like, wow. And then he walks away, and he's with Keltner. And now they're standing next to us, and they're, we're standing in front of George Harrison's uh, the backstage where he's, he's taking a break. And I'm sure Bob wants to be invited in there at some point, which, which he was. But while we're there, he grabs a push broom, he's standing right next to it, and he's acting like he's sweeping the floor. And Keltner's saying to him, hey, you missed the spot. And <laughs> yeah, okay, well, I'll get right at it. <laughs> All of a sudden, Boston says to me, he's standing right next to me. And I said, no, I think I should. What else am I going to say to him? So all of a sudden, he looks at me, and I had... I had a uh, black leather jacket that I actually bought up at Woodstock with a Who patch on it that said Who Tour 19, I think it said 70. And uh, he looked at that and he said, did you go to that show? I said, I sure did. And he said, so I, he said, I was out of town. How was it? I said, it was incredible. I said, but they're my favorite rock band. He goes, yeah, yeah, they're really something else. I said, speaking of great shows at Madison Square Garden, I saw you perform, and I was with my friend Kevin, who was 12 years old, I think, at the time. And I said, man, that was some amazing show. And all of a sudden, he got very, very serious. He pulled down his glasses again, down to his nose, leaned over to me, nose to nose, and said, yeah, why? And I thought, holy Jesus, this guy, you know, this is, you know, why? So I had to run the tape back. I said, well, Ted and I were in the fifth row. On one side was Allen Ginsberg. On the other side was, I, I can't remember, there were all these famous Joni people. Mitchell, too, right? 
didn't buy it. I said it was just 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 sitting in the crowd was inside. I said, and I for some reason I thought you were going to be laid back. I had you know I said, You came out like a damn fullback, man. You had on a white shirt, black cowboy boots, black jeans. I said, and the band played their ass off. And I said, man, it was one of the most exciting things. All of a sudden, he started smiling. He went, yeah, yeah, that was a pretty good show. <laughs> I said, yeah, it was. And then I made the mistake of saying, even my son Kevin liked it. Mm -hmm. And then he went into the, pulling his sunglasses down to his nose, leading into being there. Yeah, what he liked about it. Oh, my God. <laughs> I said, well, you know, when I used to play your records in Connecticut, every time I put them off, my son Kevin would say, put them on, I mean. That guy sucks. He can't sing. His voice sucks. And I said, but you know what he heard you do? It's all right, Ma. It's only me and I'm bleeding. I said, he went back to school and he wrote an essay about it and his school teacher made him go and perform that to each class in the school in Connecticut. Wow. And he said, you know what that means to me? And I said, no. He said, that means that my music is going on to your son's generation. He said, that's very meaningful. That's, that's more meaningful than a lot of awards. That we get for doing things. He said, I, I, I like that. So, so didn't um, Dylan invite you, like, didn't you have dinner with him that night? No, I'll tell you what happened. So after the show, we all go back to the very same room. Now, the whole band is there. John Scott, who was the leader of, of uh, George's band, and everybody in the band. I knew most of these guys because they're all LA musicians. So we all go back there to this big room, and now the room is buzzing. When I was there, it was empty. And then George showed up, and then, you know, now there's caterers, and there's all these people, there's all the musicians. The place is packed. And when we walk in, Tosca and I are kind of looking around like, well, where are we supposed to go? We're just kind of like, you know, we're like nobodies. And all of a sudden, we look up, and Bob Dylan is... He's got his finger crooked and he's going like this, come over here. So we, and he's sitting, he's kind of half laying on one of those day bed type of things. And we go over, he says, sit down. So we sit next to him and everybody's coming by. Bob, are you okay, Bob? Is everything all right, Bob? And uh, I thought, geez, this, this is amazing because he hardly talks to anybody. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm okay. And when he did the Rolling Thunder tour, there were musicians that said they were on the whole tour. He never talked to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, the way he said, "Get my friends a drink." So the waiter asked us what we wanted to drink. So we got a drink, and all of a sudden, he lights a joint and he nudges me and he hands it to me. Mm -hmm. I took a couple of good hits off of the joint. Now, you know. Prerogative would say that I should give the joy to Tosca, but this is Dylan's. I don't know what what should I do? And I, I kind of hesitated. And he nudged me. He says, "No, no." And he points to her, so she takes a hit. And we, so we pass this joint around, and that's how we spent the evening. And when the evening was over, after all the festivities and, and everything else. Tosca and I got in the car and we said, who in the hell is going to believe what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> hey, so what, at what part, so what, at one point in your career, um, you, you represented, you promoted Frampton uh, music. And t tell, tell us that story. Well, that was the same. I, I was with A&M Records. Right. And, and uh, I actually knew Frampton before before I even went to A&M Records. We became friends. His girlfriend, Penny, who ended up in the movie Almost Famous as the groupie, she uh, 
she was our receptionist. And I remember meeting her. She said, I'm going out with this guy, Peter Frampton. Do you know him? I said, no. She said, well, he's really a good musician, blah, blah, blah. So we became friends. And Peter and Penny, they used to, they lived in Austin, New York, and they used to drive their Carmen Gia down to my apartment in the village. And we'd go and uh, have dinner at some funky little Indian restaurant or something. And then I'd say, do you have enough gas money to get home? And he'd say, well, I... I don't know. I, I couldn't. I said, well, you know, I'm broke. I went through a divorce and you, you, you don't have anybody. Here, you think three, four bucks would help you? Oh, yeah. And a carbon gear? Oh, that'd be good. <laughs> so every time we, we do that. So anyway, at one point, I got the job as national promotion man for A&M Records. Uh, they came to interview me in New York at the Sherry Netherland Hotel. And, uh, so when I went back, I said to, at some point, I said to Penny, and I said to Peter, I've got an announcement to make. I'm leaving ESP management. I think it was called Windfall Management. That was between Bud Prager and uh, Felix Papillardi. When they signed their deal, they said this could be a windfall for us. And that became the management company. And Bud Prager managed Mountain, right? Right, right, exactly. And I was involved in all of that. So anyway, Peter got all nervous and he said, you're leaving Winfrey, where are you going? And I said, I'm just going to be the national album promotion man for A&M Records. And he went, what? That's my label. And I said, that's right, daddy <laughs> And he hugged me and we hugged each other and because we had become really good friends. And his manager, D. Anthony, hated me for that. There were many managers that really hated it when a uh, person from the record company took a liking to them and started uh, spending more time with their artists because they were so paranoid that you were going to say something to them that uh, was going to put them in a bad light, which was crazy, you know, it was nuts. But uh, so anyway... Uh, Peter used to call me in the middle of the night and say, uh, you know, D wants me to, uh, I, I want to get rid of my manager. And I say, why? And he'd say, he's against everything I'm against, I want. He said, if I get rid of him, it's going to cost me a million dollars. And I said, Peter, you better get in there. You better get yourself an attorney. You know, you got, you got to, he says, well, I do have an attorney, but it's the same attorney as Dean's attorney. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. How does that work? I thought that was illegal in America. <laughs> and he said, well, Dean said it to, he explained it. Oh, no, we'll keep it all in the family. We'll both have the same attorney. We'll keep it both in the family. And I said, well, let me ask you this. When the, when the shit hits the fan, who do you think that the attorney is going to represent? A little pipsqueak like you has sold nothing records for D. Anthony. <laughs> He's got all these big acts and a uh, very, very powerful guy in the music business. I said, you're going to be screwed. And he said, yeah, you're right. So that that's what he called. They said, I'm going to get rid of it. It's going to cost me a million bucks. So anyway, he did. But before that happened, Frampton comes alive. Uh, Richie, let me interrupt you for a second. We only have five minutes left, so um, tell us this, you know, the, the part about the double album and how you helped urge, you know, you know well, Frampton I, to I do went that. To, went to Winterland to see him play. I took my friend Tos, uh, not Tosca, I took my friend Kristen Olsen, and uh, I said, we're going to go see my friend play at Winterland. She said, oh, and she was from San Francisco. He said, oh, it's the last show I saw was The Grateful Dead. I'm really, I'm too old to go stand in a big crowd. I said, Christy, we're going to be on stage. This guy's a friend of mine. She said, oh. So we were standing on stage while he did this just absolutely amazing show, which ended up being a fact that comes alive. But as he was doing it, he'd look over at me every once in a while and wink and smile, and I'd give him the thumbs up. So at the end of the show, he comes over, he's toweling off, the crowd is, is going nuts, and he says, 
So Richie, what did you think? I said, oh my God, this was just so wonderful, Peter. I said, the only thing is, of all the concerts I've ever seen you do, and I've seen a lot of them, as you know, this was just way over the top, just magnificent. Everything was terrific. I said, but you know what's a drag? But now it's just going up into the atmosphere and nobody's ever going to hear it again. And he said to me, what are you talking about? Wally Hyde is recording the studio truck. He's here. We recorded the whole concert. We're going to go back down and listen to it. Come on, Richie. Come on, uh, uh, what's your name? <laughs> so, yeah, so, uh, Kristen. So we went back and listened to the whole concert mm -hmm. again in the truck. So D. Anthony didn't want him to put out a double album because he says, no one's going to buy that. Um, we, we right. only single album, and then it got to the point where I guess with your enthusiasm behind the idea of the double album and everything, um, it, it went through and it happened and became like the biggest selling record of all time at that point before like my old Michael Jackson came around, right? Right, and that's because when Jerry Moss came to town, he called me and he said, I'm coming to town, I, wanna, I want you to go with me. I'm going to listen to Peter Frampton's tapes, and I want you to be there. I said, okay. So we used to go to, uh, um, what's the famous hot dog place? That was our, Nathan's. Our was in, Nathan's. Yeah, Nathan's. We used to go to Nathan's and have hot dogs before we go out to the fancy places at nighttime. And um, Anyway, we're at Nathan's, and he says, is there anything you want to tell me? And I said, well, yeah, there is. I said, Peter called me and told me that he said, don't, don't bring up the double album situation. <laughs> don't show. I don't want you to bring that up to him. I said, so that's what I got to tell you. He said, oh, very interesting. So we had our two hot dogs, and we had two more finished our beer. And that night we went to Electric Lady, Jimi Hendrix's old studio. And now the, everybody's in one room, and I'm in the main room with uh, Jerry and with Peter and the engineer. And they start playing each song. And finally, when they got to a certain amount of songs, Peter said, well, that's it. And Jerry said, what do you mean, that's it? That's all you have? He said, well, there's more, but th that's, that's all there is for one album. And Jerry said to him, well, I, I really, I really think this should be a double album. And Peter looked at me like, oh, my God, you told him. Oh, that is so incredible. <laughs> so that, that's how that happened. That, uh, that was really good. Um, we, we got one minute left, Rich. And um, uh, those are awesome stories there. Um, yeah, amazing. I, I, just curious in one just a sort of a one word question a one word answer what in your of the people you've seen play well instead of picking one top three guitar players you've you've seen you've heard you don't have to do them in order but uh Eric Clapton is my favorite mm -hmm. I've seen him play many times uh, I met him in in London when we went over with Mountain. And Felix called me up one day and I said, come on over to my room, very confidential. I went to his room. There was this guy. The room was very dark. They had on this uh, shade over the lamp. And they had eaten some food, whatever. And all of a sudden, Felix said to me, this is my friend Eric. Eric, this is my friend Richard. And I thought, and this is when Eric used to change his look all the time. You never knew from one album to the other what he's going And Eric said to me, very nice to meet you. Would you like to smoke some opium? <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. And we were going out that night to meet the Who at, at this uh, club. And so I smoked this bowl with him, this sticky stuff. I got so stoned, I didn't know where my ass stopped in the chair began. <laughs> Hello, mellow, mellow. People were coming to the door. Come on, we're going. And I'd stand up and then I'd sit back down. And... That, oh, my God. That, that's so good. Um, we got to go. 
And uh, Meigs and I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and telling those fantastic stories. Yeah, all about groups that we love. So it's just so great for us to hear it. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks again, Richie. See ya. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.